God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of love. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, crucified, reigning, risen, and returning, and by the Holy Spirit, convicting, guiding, helping, interceding. We thank you for the evidence of your grace bestowed on this university, this faculty, and these students. We thank you for the opportunity to learn and to grow, recognizing that people the world over would give nearly anything to be part of an endeavor like this. As we begin a new academic year, we invoke your presence among us, asking for your blessing on this institution, on its leaders and their oversight, on its staff and their service, on its faculty and their teaching, and on its students and their learning. 
We pray that in all things we might know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, to be filled with all the fullness of God. Keep us, find us faithful, enduring to live fruitful lives for your glory, nourishing humanity by the cross. Amen.
We pride ourselves in civility and community, and we commit ourselves to the following values that shape our daily actions. Christian community, liberal arts, the individual, a diverse student body, continuous improvement, student leadership, and the future. And, ultimately, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Good morning, and welcome to this opening convocation. I would like to recognize at this point all of our new students, whether you're a freshman or if you are transferring from another institution to Anderson this year, if you will please stand so that we could recognize and welcome you. Thank you. For those of you who are joining our family, we would like to say welcome. Uh, we would like to say that we hope that black and gold will become part of your permanent wardrobe. We would like to say that you will make many friends, uh, lifelong friends at this place, both students and faculty and staff. And we pray God's blessing upon you. That he would bless you and help you to become the person that he intends you to be. So again, welcome to this opening convocation. And now our provost, Dr. Ryan Neal, is going to introduce our new faculty members. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our new faculty, but before I do that, I do, would, would like to note that those of you who have an 1120 class, you get automatic approval to be late. It's very rare that we get a chance to hear from our president, and this is a uh, once a year event, so do not worry about what your uh, Apple Watch says. Uh, I will read the names and titles of our new faculty if I could get them to briefly stand up and then sit down so we can uh, see them all. I would appreciate it, and we'll hold our applause until the end. Dr. Chuck Williamson, Dean, School of Public Service and Administration. Dr. Chrissy Butler, Associate Professor of Spanish. Dr. Ryan Butler, Assistant Professor of History. Dr. Coyote Karunwi, Assistant Professor of Physics. Dr. Josiah Ricewig, Assistant Professor of Mathematics. Professor Tracy Carter, Instructor of Mathematics. Professor Matthew Ball, Instructor of Production and Supply Chain Management. One of the best dressed this morning, Dr. Kagan Shaw, Assistant Professor of Philosophy. <laughs> Dr. Colby Redd, Assistant Professor of Healthcare Management. Dr. Heath Burton, Assistant Professor of Kinesiology. Professor Jeffrey Thompson, Assistant Professor of Kinesiology. Dr. Melissa Kolar, Assistant Professor of Kinesiology. Dr. Susan Denninger, Assistant Professor of Physical Therapy. Professor Tabitha Merritt, Instructor of Nursing. Dr. Brandy Porter, Assistant Professor of Nursing. Dr. David Solish, Associate Professor of Theater. Dr. Michelle Dosher, Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice. We have two who are not able to make it today. Dr. Kenneth Knapp, Professor and Director of Cybersecurity. And Dr. Matthew Deruig, Assistant Professor of Physical Therapy. Please join me in welcoming our new faculty.
Again, good morning, and welcome to Opening Convocation. For most of our new students, this is your first formal university convocation, and you're probably a little curious about what to expect. Uh, I want to thank our uh, musicians, especially our bagpipers, for making this 
occasion uh, even more special than it, than it already is. But this is a formal convocation. Uh, all of your convocations will not be uh, formal uh, as we meet for worship every week, but some of the convocations are formal. Webster says that a convocation is a ceremonial assembly of a college or university. It's just as simple and as complex as that. And for us, this opening convocation has special meaning. It symbolizes the beginning of a new academic year and the promise that lies within. It gives us a chance to reflect on what it means to be an evangelical Christian academic community. And in this new year, there are many exciting things taking place in the life of our university. So join me for just a moment as I highlight some of these advances. First, I'm pleased to share with you that we have the best national rankings in our history. U.S. News and World Report ranks us in the top tier of regional universities in the South. And in addition, U.S. News also indicates that Anderson continues to be considered a more selective university, meaning that we're very choosy in the individuals that we admit to study here at AU. Beyond that, Anderson was also ranked in the top 20 universities in the South for undergraduate teaching quality. Congratulations, faculty. Among the top 20 universities in innovation and among the top 32 universities ranked for being a best financial value. We were also ranked this year by the Wall Street Journal among the 801 best universities in America, according to their method. In particular, they noted that of the 801 schools, now get this, a Anderson is ranked 27th in the nation for the remarkable level of student engagement that we enjoy here on our campus. And by that, they mean that students are highly involved on campus. Students are quick to recommend AU to their friends. Students have high quality interactions with faculty and other students. And finally, that we have an unusually high number of academic programs that have achieved specialized accreditation at the national level compared to other institutions. We also celebrate our enrollment. We welcome one of the largest groups of new students in our history. And you demonstrated that as you stood a minute ago, 725 freshmen and transfers of you to be exact. And we have the largest, we believe that we will have the largest overall enrollment in our history after all the numbers shake out. Last year, our enrollment was over 3,500 students. This year, while it's not yet official, we have a strong indication that our headcount enrollment will be closer to 2,600 students. And of note is the fact that our graduate school enrollment has increased 17% over the last year. Also of significance, nationally, the average freshman retention rate is 72%. In South Carolina, among all the colleges and universities, it's a little bit lower, it's 69%. Our freshman retention rate moved above 80% this year, putting us in the top 10% of southern regional universities in South Carolina and across the nation to have such a high retention rate as well as above the state and national averages. We are in the fifth year of being recognized as an Apple Distinguished School. Many of you already know that. In the university category, uh, we are one of 24 universities in the world to achieve this distinction. This summer, we successfully launched our highly selective Doctor of Physical Therapy program, which is limited to 28 admitted students annually. In athletics, we have hired a very capable head lacrosse coach, and we will be playing lacrosse next fall and, uh, and uh, enjoying lacrosse on our campus. Uh, and this is something we, uh, we all want to celebrate. We added 176 parking spaces to the campus. That's where we have an applause. And finally, over the last 12 months, some 900 students and summer campers accepted Christ as Lord and Savior as a result of the Lord working in their lives. <laughs> so this is truly a very exciting time in the development of your university, and it's my joy to share it with each of you. People on campus on this campus are working hard, and that hard work has resulted in some amazing developments and growth for our institution. 
but we will deceive ourselves if we think that we've achieved anything on our own. Evidence on this campus abounds that God has had his hand on this university for over a century. People come and go, but God is our constant, and we acknowledge him and we give him thanks for every good thing that happens on our campus. And may it continue to be our prayer that he alone will be glorified in everything that we do. For those of you, uh, again, who are new to our campus, it's been a long-standing tradition uh, for the president to give an opening convocation message. And I look forward to this time each year because it gives me a chance to share with you some very personal and heartfelt thoughts as we begin the academic year together. Now, before um, I started speaking, you heard a song that was released 29 years ago in 1990. It was released before all the students and a few of our younger faculty members in this room were born. It was performed by the American rock band Styx. It was written by vocalist and keyboardist Dennis DeYoung, who incidentally is known to be a devout Roman Catholic. Now some of you are familiar with Styx, and if you're not familiar with them, you've probably heard a lot of their songs that are still popular on the 90s radio shows. And like several bands of that era, they're still active with a few original members, but for the most part, they peaked years ago. Well, I grew up and went to college when Styx was at the height of its popularity. And now, I don't tell many people this, and in just a moment you'll realize why. Uh, when I was in high school, I used to fantasize that I was either the lead electric guitarist or the drummer for Styx. And if that's hard for you to imagine, I'm going to tell you something else you're really not going to believe. Um, when I was in college those years ago, I was a lifeguard with thick blonde hair and a tan and generally a cool dude. But as you no doubt see, things have deteriorated significantly for me since those days. <laughs> I don't let it get me down, though. I love my exceedingly serious life as a college president, and I still have fun. And yes, on occasion, I still fantasize that I'm the lead guitar player or the drummer. I just hope none of you ever see me in my car at a stoplight singing to a stick song and using my fingers to pretend to play my steering wheel like a set of pearl drums. The reason I asked to allow you to see Show Me the Way to be played today is that even though it's almost 30 years old, the message is as timely today as it was in 1990. Dennis DeYoung originally wrote the song for his son Matthew as something of a pseudo hymn about the struggle to keep the faith in a world filled with hatred. And after its release, the song scaled the charts in January 1991 just prior to the Gulf War, and many radio DJs mixed the song with voice tracks of parents whose children were headed off to fight in that war. Well, the single rose up in the Billboard Hot 100 chart all the way to number three. It also hit number three on the Adult Contemporary chart, remaining in the top 40 of that chart for 31 weeks. Well, obviously it resonated with the American public then, and it remains popular today. After all, it's a catchy melody, one we will probably sing in our minds the rest of our day, and it has a definite um, focus with spiritual overtones that provoke us to reflection and evaluation. And equally as obvious to those of us who uh, scrutinized the lyrics a few minutes ago is the fact that at least in one way, the message is inconsistent with mature Christian thinking. Yet it represents an age-old dilemma that both characterizes and haunts humanity and always will. For that reason, I've decided to use it today as a text upon which to frame a message. These lyrics are penned during the time of my young adulthood, but I suspect they would ring true for any generation. If there's ever been a time in my life that seemed any more challenging than the present, I don't remember it. To be sure, humanity has experienced challenging times before, and history demonstrates that things do get better, especially when humanity learns from its mistakes. Yet here we are in one of those challenging times, hoping and praying for transformation. And now in my mid-50s, that's an exaggeration, 
I'm distressed that it seems that humanity has not, in fact, learned from its mistakes. It seems to me that we just keep making some of the same and even bigger mistakes. But I am hopeful for humanity, even as I put my faith and trust in Christ alone. And these lyrics remind me that the world is far from perfect and will always be filled with challenges and problems. That's just the nature of a world filled with imperfect people, and that includes all of us. Who is it bothered when we hear the, the lyrics about the heroes and legends we knew as children have fallen to idols of clay? The, strong, the song describes our world as a place filled with hatred. Well, hatred is an interesting word that can mean many things. It reminds me not only of emotions, but of actions as well. The way people manipulate and abuse one another. It reminds me of a man's routine, of man's rather, routine human, inhumanity to man. And the lyrics remind us on a deeper uh, personal level of the imagery of Adam and Eve's Garden of Eden experience in which we realize that we have all a choice to make in life. The writer asks for guidance in these matters, demanding, show me the way. And on two occasions, he specifically asks for deliverance. Take me to the river and wash my illusions away, he sings in one verse, and bring me to the mountain and take my confusion away, he sings in another. And in so many ways, this song very accurately describes the cries of people from ages past all the way up to the present who seek relief from confusing and discouraging times. One of the questions that puzzles me is, to whom are these words addressed? Well, the most logical assumption is that it's a prayer to God. On the other hand, it could be a plea to humanity, or perhaps it could be a combination of the two. And I don't know for certain, but I think it's probably both. I'm convinced that it's a double petition, if you will. First, it's a prayer to God for understanding, deliverance, and hope. And second, it's a plea to humanity for transformation. God, show me that this is not what you intended. Help me understand why this is the way the world is. God, tell me there is hope beyond this life, and there is a purer version of reality that awaits me. World, tell me that this is not the best we can be and do. Tell me that there is promise in us as a human race. Tell me that our best days are yet ahead. Tell me that our world doesn't have to be a place so full of sin and hatred. This song and the dilemma it describes and the petitions it issues, the questions it raises, and all of it has a great deal to do with your education and your life. It's a song from my youth, and it strikes yet today at the things of our contemporary world. So let me make a few points and then try to bring it all together for you. The first point I want to make is this. I don't have to tell you any of you, that our world is a very troubled place. You know that. We have multiple problems and issues that you and I can recite. Some of the ones that weigh most heavily on us at this present time are, even as we live today on September the 11th, global terrorism. That's certainly one of the problems that we have in our world. We have a trade war with China. We have the issue of striking the right balance between the dream of immigration for many and the cold reality of homeland security. And we're all troubled by the deterioration of civility and the lack of bipartisanship in government to its lowest level ever. Well, I'll tell you the truth. The world didn't get in this shape overnight and we're not going to get it out of this shape overnight either. No one generation is to blame entirely, although each succeeding generation seems to make a contribution. And no future generation is ever going to experience a perfect world, at least in its present form. Yet as human beings, we hold great potential for transforming our world into a less troubled place. One of the symbols of Anderson University is the acorn and the oak leaf. The acorn is symbolic of potential because we all know that oak leaves come from acorns. So the operative word here is potential. Potential is a key concept for all of us. It's a linear 
philosophical concept with a beginning and a direction that takes shape and sequence. And as it relates to human beings, we set out to reach our potential over the course of our lives, hoping and praying that as we mature and experience life, that we will incrementally become more of the person that we have the possibility and the promise to be. We all hope for that. But as you look closer at the nature of linear things, let me caution you not to overlook the key concept of linearity. That is, that linearity is having or being a response or output that is directionally proportional to the input. And what this means for you and for me is this. Whatever you achieve in life will be directionally proportional to how much you put into the effort to achieve it. If you don't use your talents and abilities to do your best, you will settle for less than you're capable. And the same concept can be transferred to us as members of a global society. If we want the world to be a better, less troubled place, we, all of us, must exert more than a small amount of effort to influence the world for good. We, the more we contribute, the better the world will be. And don't let anyone tell you that you as an individual can't make a difference. Of course, making the world a better place is no small challenge. It's what people who study business and management call a BHAG. Ever heard of that? It's an acronym for a big, hairy, audacious goal. And where do we begin? How in the world can you and I make a difference? Well, it's simple. You begin in your heart. You live out your desire to make a difference by the way you live from this point forward, including how you relate to people on this campus, and by reaching out beyond the campus in the many ways that students and employees serve and go on mission. And when you graduate, four years from now, from now, under those oak trees, hopefully, you'll take what you learn here and apply it in your career and in your community in such a way that you'll be a catalyst for positive change. And because I believe so strongly in you and the transformative power of Anderson University and the experience that you're going to have, I have great faith that more than just a few of you are going to one day be some of the most powerful and influential leaders in our state, local, and federal government. And when you get to that point, I beg you to use your power and your influence for good. When I stand on this stage and look out, and see all of your young, promising faces, I can't help but wonder what would our nation and our world be like today if more of our politicians and world leaders were graduates of this university. Well, regardless of whether your aspirations include that kind of leadership or a less public kind of role, it's important to remember that you can be the leader and the influencer whatever your career and wherever you live. Yes, I'm sorry to say that our world is poisoned by significant problems, but I want to tell you that you are, in large part, with God's help, the antidote. Did you catch that? God's ultimately control always has been and always will be, but he's depending on us, his children, to do our part in transforming human history. And he's gifted all of us with incredible talent, skills, knowledge, and abilities, and it's up to us to hone those things and to use them for good. I know you want an education that's going to allow you to accomplish your goals, to get into graduate school, and to be successful in your career, and that's great. But if that's all you want, you are so not going to reach your potential. Within each of you is a potential to be a strong force for incredible good in this world. You can be the kind of example and the role model that gives others hope. Is that what you want? If so, I want to tell you that there are two things on which you absolutely must concentrate while you're at Anderson. And if you do these things, you can make a significant difference in the condition of your world. First, you have to change the world by becoming a well-educated problem solver. The world is in desperate need of well-educated individuals who can analyze disparate information, make sense of it, and solve problems. And being a problem solver also means that you are a critical thinker. Sometimes we say that a critical thinker is a person who can think for themselves and make good judgments, but who is also and always open 
to the possibilities that theirs may not be the only valid or good judgment about a matter. And here may I offer a cautionary word. Be careful not to confuse being a critical thinker with a person who has an opinion. People with opinions are a dime a dozen. People who wait to speak until they have a well-informed opinion are far less plentiful. On this, I agree with the pastor who said, if you don't have an understanding of the key facts about a subject, you really aren't entitled to an opinion. And even when you have an informed opinion, you must always take into consideration the possibility that you may not have had access to all the facts you needed to make the judgment you made, and upon discovering new facts, you might alter your judgment. An educated person is cautious not to rush to judgment until he or she is acquainted with some facts. You know, even Einstein is known to have said, after positing a brilliant new theory, but I might be wrong. Well, we're going to help you develop your critical thinking and problem-solving skills, but just remember that the extent to which you learn what you need to know to be successful in your career and in your life begins with you and rest mainly on your shoulders. You have the potential to become a critical thinker and a problem solver and to get better and better at it throughout your life's journey. The question is, will you? The second way that you can make the world a better place is by becoming a person of good character, integrity, wholesome values, and faith. One of the biggest illusions in our world is what we see on the internet and television that we think is real. And so many of the people glamorized through the media are people who live on the edge of societal norms, and their lifestyles are celebrated because they're strange enough to appeal to our obsession with the novel, the out of the ordinary, and the provocative. And that's good for the media outlets because they can sell that alluring product. But we make a great mistake when we believe that the way most celebrities think and behave represents mainstream America. It's simply not true. Celebrities are qualified to act and to be celebrities, but they are far from qualified to tell you and me what to think, what to do, or how to feel. Another issue is that with increasing frequency, we see legitimately established persons of authority, power, and influence engage in behavior that leads to public disgrace. And the young reminds us of this when he sings, Every day I'm more confused as the saints turn into sinners. We're painfully aware of a growing list of global officials and other leaders who fall from grace. Often they've reached the heights of their careers, they deal with matters of great importance, but they all have clay feet. And when they fall, they disappoint us, they discourage us, and they confuse us. And history records that at least some icons of every generation fall, and while it disappoints and discourages, it should not surprise us. We all have clay feet, and we are all capable of great and disgracing failure. Thank God for His grace. The problem is that our culture has become so defensive of personal and professional misconduct that what was once considered shameful by human standards when I was a college student is now just mildly offensive. That's why we see fallen leader after fallen leader refuse to acknowledge their actions. They spin their circumstances, they rewrite history, and they redefine reality and even the meaning of verbs, and they arrogantly refuse to take responsibility for their actions. And when we buy into the arguments that suggest that kind of behavior is acceptable, we are both the victims and the agents of a philosophy called moral relativism. You're familiar with that, wherein we dismiss the notion that there are God-given moral standards. Conversely, we argue that truth is a fluid concept that changes depending on one's culture and experiences. The extreme conclusion of moral relativism is that there is absolutely no absolute truth. Of course, the flaw of this philosophy is that it equates truth with one's personal perspective. And that being the case, nothing ever really is true, it's just your perception of reality. Now, we all have different perspectives on various things based on our individual experiences. And that's a good thing, else the world would be a dull and boring place. But our personal experiences are subjective, and that subjectivity means that sometimes our perspectives don't, in fact, reflect reality. As a Christ-centered university, 
Anderson University submits to you that truth is stable as opposed to fluid. We submit to you that God is the creator of heaven and earth and all reality. And if you have the faith to believe that, then that logically means to you that God is also the creator of truth. He knows everything there is to know about the world he created. So he is all-knowing. Your experience may be different from mine, but God is unchangeable and stable. And because you and I are not all-knowing, we are incapable of defining truth. That's God's job, not ours. And God has defined truth, and he has revealed it to us in the form of the Bible, and within, the, within it are the very standards and the principles by, by which God intends for us to live as individuals and as a society. Young men and women, that's why I want to say to you this morning in great tenderness and loving concern, if you want to be a truly educated person, realize that it's not just about what happens to your mind while you're in college. It's about what happens to your heart as well. It takes attention to both if you don't, if you want to live the, the authentic good life. So I beg you, guard yourself. Don't pick up your values from a secular culture that's lost its way and knows not the things of good character, integrity, wholesome values, and faith, you know deep inside that there is a better way. I recommend to you to be like one of our recent graduates who upon being asked what was the main thing she would take away from her experience at AU said this, I have learned to take everything I read and everything I hear and everything I see and compare it to the truth with a capital T. Now, I will confess to you that I don't know much about the personal lives of the Styx band members. Some appear to come from a faith-based perspective. In fact, I know some of them do. Others I'm not so sure about. But on the whole, though, I think they're not a bad group of people. The lyrics of most of their songs taken in the proper context are not nearly as coarse as some of the rock bands of that era. And with some of their work, we get a glimpse into the things that puzzle and concern human beings. And what I hear in this song more than anything is that people long for someone to define reality, to illuminate the path by example, and restore their hope and their faith. And that's where you come in. I'm going to make, make a prediction, and I'm very confident in it. The confusion in our world is going to continue. The illusion is going to continue. The problems are going to continue. The condition of our world is going to get worse, not better, on the whole. That is, unless you and more like you rise up and say to the world, enough is enough. By the way you live your lives, say to the world, let me offer you a solution. Let me be a good example of how we are to live and relate to one another. Let me be a source of encouragement to you. Let me tell you you can have hope. And please, just once, give me the opportunity to help you discover faith, true faith. You want the world to be a better place? It begins with you. You must be the transformation that you envision. You must be the change that you desire. You won't solve all the world's problems, and you won't be able to wash away the world's illusions or take away its confusion entirely. But you can be a strong force for good in an imperfect world that groans for redemption. With each of you, within each of you is the potential to do just that. The question is, will you? Well, I can tell you that there's no better place for a group of future problem solvers, role models, and hope givers to equip themselves for that calling than Anderson University. And that leads me to the final point in our analysis of Show Me the Way. A song from my era to yours that has a lot to say about the human dilemma but not much about the way out of our predicament. A song that poses a critical question but fails to answer it. The opening line goes like this. Every night I say a prayer in the hopes there is a heaven. In that one little line, the existence of heaven is called into question. Life after death is called into question. And the very existence of God is called into question. 
Now, I don't think that was a mistake. I think Dennis DeYoung knew when he wrote it that of all the questions humans ask in life, that one is the big one. Truth is that in our society, there are a great many visions of what heaven is and what it will be like. Research indicates that an overwhelming majority of Americans believe there is a heaven. They also believe that they have a good to excellent chance of getting there. But sadly, many of them don't know the nature of heaven, what it will be like, and what it takes to get there. Now, I'm not a theologian, I don't pretend to be one, but I'm not going to give you a lecture on heaven today, so you can rest assured of that. But I am going to hit the highlights, and it begins with this. The most important concept about heaven that we need to remember is that Jesus is there. Jesus Christ is the substance of heaven. If you've given your heart to him as Lord and Savior when you die, his voice is the voice that is going to welcome you there. More than anything else, heaven is the substance of his life. But until we get there, how shall we live? Well, I can tell you that if you believe in heaven, it means, means a new way of life. Don't just take my word for it. Paul says, the way you show forth your belief in heaven is with a new life. Listen to what he says in Colossians chapter 3. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears you shall also appear with him in heaven. But that's not all. He goes on to say that setting your heart and mind on these things means that the kind of life you live must now take a specific shape. This is the way people who believe in heaven live. Put to death, he says, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Kill those things. And rid yourselves of all such things as these, and he gives a list. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off the old self and put on the new. Therefore, as God's chosen people who believe in heaven, where Christ is, put on the clothes of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against each other and forgive each other as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Did you all hear that? If you want to fix your mind on things above, if you want to live your life as though you believe in heaven, you let that expression find belief, let that belief rather find expression in a godly life. C.S. Lewis said that the reason we're so captivated by pearl and gold is that we're far too easily pleased. For some, the best we can envision heaven is glittering jewels and shining lights, mansions and streets of gold. But the scripture says, no, the best thing about heaven is that our Lord Jesus will be there. And we will see him as he is, and everything that we have only partly understood in this life will then be fully understood. At that time, illusion and confusion will be no more. When we set our minds on things above, then shall come to pass the vision of a better world that Paul left with us. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonister one another with all wisdom through the psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Show Me the Way, it's a catchy tune with some great lyrics. It was a bestseller, but it's incomplete. It leaves the main question unanswered. It leaves out the rest of the story, but now you know it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you the truth. Only Jesus can fill the spiritual void about which Dennis DeYoung sings. And that's the greatest hope you have. That's the best deal you're ever going to get. Jesus and the eternal life he offers is the rest of the story. 
He can fill that void in your life. And I tell you this, and it is also true. If you were to live like the scripture I just read, if you were to live like a citizen of the world who knows the rest of the story, Jesus will make you a living example of the hope, the faith, and the way that the world is desperate to see. Think about that. Use your time at AU to become a well-educated problem solver. Be a person of good character, integrity, wholesome values, and faith. Live a full life and have fun doing it. Be the change that you envision and let it begin today. I hope you have a wonderful academic year. May the Lord bless us in all that we do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. is Latin for nourishing mother. In academia, the term alma mater has two familiar meanings. The first refers to the school, college, or university from which one graduates. The second meaning refers to the title given to a college or university's official song or anthem. Both uses in academia are expressive of the image of one's university as a place that cares for its students in the spirit of a mother who cares for and nourishes her child. Freshmen, today, beginning today, you will be known collectively as the class of 2023. And it is our hope that during your all too brief time on our campus, this academic community known as Anderson University will nourish your mind and your heart in such a way that your feelings towards AU will reflect your fondness and love for it, as well as your deep and abiding loyalty to protect its mission and traditions for those who follow you. Today, on the occasion of your opening convocation, you will sing the alma mater for the first time. Over the years, there will be many occasions on which you will sing it again, and we pray that it will become so meaningful to you that you will know it, that you will understand the depth of the emotions it conveys, and you will be able to sing it with joy and thanksgiving for all the ways AU will have changed your life, for all the things and people this place will have made possible for you. The alma mater you will sing today is the second version in the 108-year history of Anderson University. The first version was sung by members of the AU community from a, for a full century, from 1911 to 2011. In 2010, the university commissioned two-time Grammy Award-winning arranger and recording artist Johnny Mann to pen and set music to the centennial alma mater. Mr. Mann was an entertainer whose season of fame was primarily in the 60s and 70s, and he was known for many things, but he is often known for having been the original voice of Theodore of Alvin and the Chipmunks. He retired to Anderson and became a wonderful friend of Anderson University. Mr. Mann died in the summer of 2014, but he left behind a beautiful memory from his heart called The Sounds of Anderson. A group of our upperclassmen are going to sing through the alma mater so that you can become familiar with the words and melody. I ask you to follow the musical score in your program while they sing. And following this, I will invite you to stand and join in the singing of The Sounds of Anderson. Sounds of joy, the tree. 
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you today for this great institution, Lord God. We thank you for its faculty, leaders, students, and staff. We pray and we humbly receive your mercy and your grace on a daily basis. We thank you for your blessings and your favor that it flows to us. And we thank you for your hand of protection and the blood of Jesus that covers us. We pray that as we leave this opening convocation, Lord God, that you would continually cover us, bless us, and that we would serve you with a spirit of excellence here at Anderson University. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you.